Hi there, let's take a deep dive into the untold history, strategic role, and lasting legacy of one of the most advanced aircraft ever built. In the dim corridors of the RAF Museum at Cosford, a single white aircraft sits quietly on display. Its lines are elegant, its form still futuristic even decades after it was grounded forever. Visitors stop, stare, and ask the inevitable question, why was this never flown in service? The aircraft is the TSR-2, and the answer to that question opens the door to one of the most remarkable and tragic chapters in the history of aviation. The TSR-2 was supposed to change everything. It was an aircraft years ahead of its time, boasting unmatched low-level performance, terrain-following radar, supersonic strike capability, and the versatility to conduct tactical reconnaissance and nuclear delivery. Yet it never went beyond the prototype stage. The full story of its rise and fall reveals a nation caught between the pursuit of sovereign innovation and the political and economic realities of a post-imperial world. The post-World War II era was a time of immense transition for Britain. While the nation had emerged victorious, it was also financially exhausted. And yet, despite this, there remained an enduring will to retain a leadership position in defense, particularly in aerospace. The British aviation industry had already produced technological marvels like the Gloucester Meteor, the first operational Allied jet, and the English electric Canberra, a jet-powered light bomber that proved extraordinarily capable. By the mid-1950s, the threat of Soviet expansion and the proliferation of radar-guided missile systems demanded a new generation of aircraft. The British Royal Air Force required a platform that could strike deep into enemy territory under the radar, deliver nuclear or conventional payloads, and return home safely without relying on foreign platforms. Thus, in 1957, the government initiated a requirement for a tactical strike and reconnaissance aircraft. High speed, high altitude, low level capable, and multi-role. The TSR-2 was born out of this vision. The British Aircraft Corporation, formed from a merger of Vickers Armstrong, English Electric, and Bristol Aircraft, was selected to develop the TSR-2. The design pushed boundaries in every direction. It would be powered by two Bristol Siddeley Olympus turbojet engines that would later be refined for the Concorde, capable of propelling the aircraft to Mach 2.3 at altitude. More critically, the TSR-2 was designed to cruise at supersonic speeds at low altitudes, hugging terrain using cutting-edge terrain-following radar, a system almost unheard of at the time. The aircraft featured fly-by-wire controls, primitive but revolutionary, an integrated avionics suite with inertial navigation, and a payload bay designed to carry everything from photo reconnaissance equipment to tactical nuclear weapons. It also incorporated short takeoff and landing capability, enabling it to operate from makeshift airstrips and forward positions, a critical asset in Cold War Europe, where established bases were likely targets for enemy strikes. Its specifications made it arguably the most advanced military aircraft in the world, on paper. In fact, it was so far ahead of its time that engineers and pilots faced steep learning curves in testing and development. But the consensus among those involved was clear. This aircraft was exceptional. Understanding the TSR-2 requires understanding its time. By the early 1960s, the Cold War had solidified. The Warsaw Pact nations were increasing both their conventional and nuclear capabilities. The Soviet Union's air defense network was formidable, bristling with radar-guided missiles and interceptors. The days of high-altitude bombers were numbered. The future of strike warfare lay in fast, low-level penetration. The TSR-2's tactical purpose was to enter Soviet airspace undetected, at treetop level, at blistering speeds, deliver its payload, and exit before the enemy could respond. It could be deployed in conventional war, but it was also a keystone in NATO's nuclear deterrent strategy. It was Britain's answer to the threat of losing its edge in aerial warfare. Despite the engineering successes, the TSR-2 quickly became a victim of its own ambition. Development costs ballooned, much of which was not due to mismanagement, but due to the aircraft's unprecedented complexity. Each component, engines, radar, avionics, was a leap forward in technology, requiring development from scratch. This caused delays, escalating expenses, and increasing scrutiny from the Treasury. Inter-service rivalry also played a role. The Royal Navy was pushing for carrier-based strike aircraft. The Army was developing missile systems. The RAF was split in opinion on whether such a complex machine was necessary or sustainable. And then there was the international angle. The United States was pressuring its NATO allies to buy American aircraft, particularly the General Dynamics F-111, a swing-wing, multi-role aircraft with similar, though not superior, capabilities. The F-111 appeared cheaper, on paper, and buying American meant offsetting some of the burden of Alliance defense. 
As Britain faced economic turmoil in the mid-1960s, the TSR-2 became an easy target. It was expensive, misunderstood by the public, and increasingly politicized. On 6 April 1965, in a shocking move, the Labour government under Harold Wilson announced the cancellation of the TSR-2 project. The decision was not simply to stop production, it was to erase it. Existing prototypes, jigs, tools, and production machinery were ordered to be destroyed. The program's remains were to be buried, literally and metaphorically. Only one prototype survived the scrapping order. It remains today as a ghost of what might have been. Many believe the cancellation was not just a financial decision but a political one. It marked a shift in Britain's defense posture, from independence to dependence on American platforms. It sent a chilling message to the British aerospace industry. Innovation without guaranteed political backing is doomed. Had it entered service, the TSR-2 would have fundamentally altered the RAF's tactical capability in Europe. Imagine it deployed during a Soviet incursion, flying low across East German forests, undetectable to radar, delivering a surgical strike on key supply lines or missile bases. With its reconnaissance variant, it could have provided critical battlefield intelligence under hostile conditions. With its nuclear capability, it would have become a keystone in Britain's deterrent. Instead, the RAF was left with aging Canberras until the tornado arrived in the late 1970s. The tornado, in many ways, picked up where the TSR-2 left off, but it took two decades and an international consortium to replicate what British engineers had already achieved alone. The TSR-2 remains an enduring symbol of what Britain's aerospace industry could achieve and what happens when strategic vision lacks political resolve. Its story resonates because it is archetypal. The dreamer meets the cynic, the builder faces the bureaucrat, and the future is lost to compromise. But in that loss is a lesson, a reminder of the cost of failing to protect national innovation from short-term thinking. Today, engineers and historians still study the TSR-2. Its design informs thinking on low-level penetration aircraft, multi-role functionality, and integrated systems. It is taught in universities and remembered with awe in RAF circles. And now the world will have a chance to see it not as a failure, but as a bold statement, a white-winged symbol of ambition that flew, even if only briefly, higher than the politics that tried to ground it.